You know, we give ourselves a bad rap, but we're genuinely empathetic as a species. I mean, we don't actually really want to kill each other. <laughs> Which is a good thing. Until your future depends on wiping out the enemy. Black Mirror is a dystopian science fiction anthology series that explores the interplay between the worst sides of humanity and its own technology. It was created by English satirist and critic Charlie Brooker, whose childhood fears of impending nuclear war led him to dream up of all of the ways in which human-created technology can go awry. What would happen, for instance, if a microchip made it possible for overprotective mothers to observe the whereabouts of their daughters at all times? Or if robot bees were reprogrammed to kill hundreds of thousands of people who made inappropriate remarks on a social media website. Black Mirror addresses questions like these, and more. And as Brooker would attest to, many of the bleak alternative realities portrayed on screen aren't far off from the reality that you and I already live in. If that's true, if the line between the Black Mirror universe and ours is increasingly blurred, then why should audiences give weight to Brooker's technological woes, and heed his warnings of a world that may or may not exist in 10, 20, or 50 years' time? He's just being paranoid, right? Well, the important piece of wisdom that Brooker wishes to communicate, and the philosophy the show is based on, is not that technology on its own is wrong, bad, or sinful. It's that technology, in particular the more advanced forms with a high abuse potential, is a drug that we haven't yet learned to administer correctly. Upon pitching the show to television networks, Brooker is even quoted with saying, If technology is a drug, and it does feel like a drug, then what, precisely, are the side effects? This area, between delight and discomfort, is where Black Mirror, my new drama series, is set. But before continuing, let's define technology in plain terms to determine its role in the Black Mirror universe. Technology is defined as any tool or set of tools that improves upon the quality of life by streamlining or mechanizing otherwise tedious, time-consuming tasks that aid survival. For instance, beavers build dams to create ponds where they can further build their living quarters, while spiders spin webs to entrap flies for consumption and human beings invented cellular devices, among other things, that would enable verbal communication across large geographical distances. The technologies that these three species employ to improve their qualities of life are, therefore, river dams, cobwebs, and cell phones. However, what's important to note is that technology does not have to be limited to glowing computer screens, internet routers, touch screens, or VR headsets. It's simply anything that manipulates the environment to our advantage and makes life better. Starting off, in the prehistoric era, as rudimentary hunting tools like sticks and crossbows and progressing into more modernized appliances that typify a conventional black mirror. Returning to the analogy that highly advanced, technological innovations are like drugs, both tech and psychotropic substances exploit the same neuropsychological hardware that has enabled our survival and reproduction for millennia. In this way, drugs fall into the same category as technology because the period of intoxication following the administration of a substance that's supposed to shake up the experience of consciousness always starts off as something to be desired, something pure and ideal and highly coveted. You can imagine the intermittent but transient bursts of euphoria you might feel following the injection of heroin, swearing to yourself that you're just trying it out, and will never return to it after you have sobered up. But then, things don't quite turn out like you had planned. The euphoria is so unfathomably pleasurable, the rush so intense, that you find yourself selling off all your assets just to get the next hit and fund your imminent and ill-fated addiction. At one point, it gets so bad that your family, for fear that you'll accidentally overdose, checks you into a rehab facility. You're now in violent withdrawal, lost and aimless and a victim of the very decisions you made that got you stuck in this mess. To that end, a drug user experimenting with his or her substance of choice neither asks nor intends to become hopelessly addicted to it. Nobody does. But in their overconfidence and naivete, 
That's what happens to them anyway, and not because of a fundamental lack of self-discipline. Rather, it's because the mind, for one reason or another, is prone to repeatedly indulging in novel activities that it perceives as pleasurable, advantageous, or beneficial, but whose unintended consequences it is incapable of foreseeing through raw intuition alone. A conflict soon manifests when the results do not accord with the expectations. And Black Mirror illustrates this point with depicting the effects of the primordial edifices of the human mind on highly advanced technological innovations, which seem woefully unaligned with each other if you've seen even a single episode of the show. Charlie Brooker aims at not simply entertaining his target audience, as is any showrunner's job, but influencing them to stave off fates similar to the main characters by developing a thoughtful, deliberated awareness of technology that, when misused or abused, warps the phenomenon of memory, the subjective experience of reality, and the flexibility to live life autonomously. The three component parts to personal freedom. This accesses engrams, your memories of what happened. Now, they are subjective. They may not be totally accurate and they're often emotional, but by collecting a range of recollections from yourself and any witnesses, we can help build a corroborative picture of the whole. No, I don't remember anything. It's a total blank. Oh, I've got something that might help. Perhaps one of the most seamless cognitive capabilities we take for granted every day would be memory, or the ability to retain, recollect, and recall learned information that's been stored in the deep recesses of the mind. All memory is either implicit or explicit. Implicit memory is a type of unconscious memory enabling fine motor skills as well as balance and coordination, while explicit memory is more conscious and enables the recollection of learned facts, and thus forms the foundation of our most enduring personality traits. More importantly, Explicit memories stored in the brain are physical in the same way that computer data stored on a hard drive are physical. This is partly why Alzheimer's disease, a degenerative neurological condition that affects 1 in 10 elderly individuals over the age of 65, and that progressively strips someone of his or her memories accumulated over a lifetime, is so insidious. Because once the physical essence, the vast arrays of the interconnected neural pathways that constitute memory are corrupted or lost, you might as well be an empty shell of a human being, incapable of remembering your own name and recognizing the faces of your dear friends and loved ones. No longer would there be any continuity in your existence, for each moment would bear no relation to the previous or upcoming ones. Everything becomes a blur. It is therefore no coincidence that memory, and all of its vulnerabilities, are so evident in Black Mirror. Consider, for instance, White Bear. This episode begins with a woman awakening in an apartment complex, disoriented and unable to recall the events of the last 24 hours. The character and the viewer are understandably perplexed by a mysterious symbol shown on a television screen as well as photos of herself with a man who appears to be her boyfriend, and a young girl. We suspect that the woman is subjected to a grander conspiracy outside of her awareness, when dispassionate voyeurs take photos and videos of her without explanation, and an unprovoked, masked man hunts her down with a shotgun. The woman joins up with Jem, who appears to be on her side and the two set off on a mission to reach a transmitter known as White Bear, and destroy the signal afflicting the voyeurs. In a twist, it is revealed that Jem is actually an employee of White Bear Justice Park, and a co-conspirator of a carefully orchestrated setup designed to punish the woman, named Victoria Scalane, over and over again for abducting and burning a child alive with her fiancé the same man we saw in the photo who committed suicide in his prison cell prior to Victoria's conviction. Victoria is subsequently relocated to the apartment complex she woke up in at the start of the episode, and has her memory wiped, doomed to receive punishment for her crimes day in and day out. Memory is also depicted in a negative light in Men Against Fire. In this episode, 
Stripe Coinage is a soldier in an elite military squad who begins to experience lapses in his perceptual functioning after neutralizing a roach. A zombie-like monster whose race is at war against humanity. Stripe suspects that the strange disturbances are linked to a possible malfunction in his neural implant, called mass, but shrugs them off when a psychologist, Arquette, assures him that nothing is wrong. Later, Stripe's squad is ambushed by a roach sniper occupying a vantage point in a nearby housing complex. Stripe and Medina raid the building, but during the exchange, Stripe's mass implant once again malfunctions and from his perspective, the roach takes on the appearance of a human woman. Medina shoots and kills her, but Stripe rescues another woman and her child, fleeing far away from the housing complex. To no avail, the woman is killed by Medina in her hideout and Stripe is captured and transferred to a prison cell, where Arquette confronts him to disclose the nature of the military operation. As it turns out, the mass implant is a device for distorting the soldier's perceptions of innocent but genetically inferior people into ravenous monsters, thus conditioning them to commit genocide and promote a healthy bloodline. The worst part is, Stripe, despite his objection to the morally bankrupt eugenics program, agreed to it when he was a dumb and unsuspecting young man but has no memory of ever abdicating his accountability. Finally, in Crocodile, Mia Nolan and her boyfriend, Rob, find themselves guilty of manslaughter after driving home from a dance club, drunk and unfit to be on the road. And accidentally running over a cyclist, Rob convinces Mia to forget about what happened, and just like that, they dump the cyclist's body and bicycle into a lake and move on with their lives. Fifteen years later, Mia is a successful businesswoman. Rob, now sober but plagued by guilt of his transgressions, informs Mia in her hotel that the wife of the cyclist they killed is looking into his whereabouts, believing that he is still out there and alive and well. When Rob asserts that he plans to write a letter to the widow divulging the truth about her husband's fate, Mia murders him and covers up his death for fear that the letter will land her in prison. Elsewhere, an insurance investigator, Shazia, is looking into the details of a roadside accident that Mia was a witness to the night she murdered Rob, using a device known as a recaller that translates human memories into raw video footage. Shazia confronts Mia asking her for information on the roadside accident, but the recaller starts playing back footage of Mia's crimes. A panicked Mia then takes Shazia captive and deciding what to do with her, murders her and drives over to her husband's house to murder him while taking a bath. Realizing that an infant child, presumably Shazia's son, has bore witness to the homicide, Mia murders him as well. By now, you can see how technology can tamper with someone's memory against his or her will, and often with a malicious intent. No longer is it a physiological mechanism for reconstructing the past, but a tool to be used in manipulating somebody into playing a sick game, deluding oneself into living in a fantasy land, and avoiding responsibility for any wrongdoing. In this world, we're all so caught up in our own heads. It's easy to lose sight of what's real, what matters. Right now, you are watching this video on a screen capable of producing fantastic, complicated, and colorful images that rival some of the most famous classical paintings. But unlike classical paintings, the images displayed on screen are produced by nothing more than the thousands of red, green, and blue pixels that illuminate, in tandem, to essentially fool your brain into perceiving objects that, for all intents and purposes, don't exist. Nonetheless, when one of your favorite characters in a television show dies, you will grieve like you've lost a member of your own family, a fraction of you believing that, on some level, it really quote-unquote happened. Or when you overcome a momentous challenge in a video game, you feel demonstrable elation. 
convincing yourself that this challenge you've completed, this obstacle that's obstructed your progress for so long, was worthwhile and had to be more than just blue light bouncing on and off your retinas. This poses an interesting question. Something that you believe exists, but in fact does not. Does that make it all the more real? The same could be asked of subscribers to a religion, who base their faith on the precondition that God can neither be interacted with nor spoken to, but stay true to their convictions, and quite vehemently. Black Mirror and other popular science fiction media like The Matrix of course suggest that the human conception of reality or the totality of our sensations and perceptions, is part and parcel of a much grander, larger plane of existence, beyond that which our senses can readily input. Thus, reality, whatever it is, must be written off as indeterminate before we can make any informed judgments about its origin point. Think back to 15 million merits. This episode features a society in which people operate stationary bikes every day to generate enough power to acquire merits. A digital currency that is exchanged for a number of commodities like food, entertainment, and accessories to virtual avatars. Weary of the monotony of his exercise routines, one day Bingham Bing, Madsen, becomes mesmerized by the singing voice of Abby Khan, a newcomer to the facility and implores her to make use of her talents by competing in a reality contest akin to American Idol. Bing spends the 15 million merits he inherited from his deceased brother to grant Abby access to the contest. However, after Abby puts on a substantive performance, singing the song Anyone Who Knows What Love Is, the three judges objectify and denigrate her in front of thousands of viewers, reassigning her to star in the pornography show Wraith Babes, to Bing's dismay. Bing works tirelessly for another 15 million merits so that he, too, can enter the contest and lash out against the three judges, complaining that... All we know is fake fodder and buying shit. That's how we speak to each other, how we express ourselves is buying shit. Well, I have a dream. The peak of our dreams is a, is a new hat for our doppel. A hat that doesn't exist. Furthermore, in Nosedive, people's social statuses are determined by a computerized rating system that, if low enough, forbids them from access to unique privileges. Lacey Pound takes this rating system very seriously, going so far as to fake her emotions to win the approval of passers-by and colleagues. But because a rating of 4 or above is considered high, while anything below a 3 is considered socially undesirable, Lacey must boost her rating to a 4.5 to purchase an upscale apartment at a substantial discount. Luckily, an old childhood friend, Naomi, unexpectedly restores communication with Lacey while she is preparing dinner. Naomi asks Lacey to deliver a sentimental speech at her wedding reception as the maid of honor, thus presenting an opportunity for Lacey to amass large numbers of positive ratings. However, in a matter of 24 hours, Lacey is unable to make it to the reception on time and receives one negative rating after another. Her score drops from a 4.2 to a 0, and upon arriving late to the reception and making a scene at it, she is taken to prison and detained. Next, playtest begins with Cooper, a 20-something enthusiast of travel, going on a pilgrimage around the globe, and reticent to speak to his mother after his father passed away from early-onset Alzheimer's. Cooper meets an attractive woman, Sonia, at a London bar and sleeps with her. The next morning, Cooper discovers that his credit card has been stolen, and is now unable to afford a plane ticket back to America. In an attempt at scraping together some funds, Cooper agrees to beta test a new video game developed by an obscure studio, which he learned from Sonya is experimenting with state-of-the-art, augmented reality technology. Namely, a headset that taps into the player's most visceral fears for dramatic effect. When Cooper tries out the headset for himself, he is transported to a virtual haunted house, and for a while, feels underwhelmed with the experience. But as increasingly strange things happen, like Sonya showing up at the house and physically assaulting Cooper with a knife, 
He panics and demands the Proctor pull him out of the game. Cooper reaches the access point, where the game exploits his fear of Alzheimer's disease and strips him of his sense of self. He manages to return to the real world, suffering from moderate emotional distress but nonetheless, flying home to finally acknowledge his mother. However, she does not recognize him, and in a twist, it is revealed that Cooper is still trapped in the game. In the real world, every synapse in Cooper's brain fired simultaneously when his phone, that he was explicitly instructed to turn off before proceeding to the upload phase, rang during a .04 second playtest, interrupting it and killing Cooper, who is disposed of in a body bag, leaving his mother to speculate upon his fate. Finally, and be right back, Martha and Ash Starmer are a happy married couple settling into a new home. But Ash, on the way to return a hire van, is tragically killed in a car accident. Martha discovers that she is pregnant with Ash's child, and researches an online service utilizing an artificial intelligence that systematically amalgamates dead people's personality traits based upon their activity on social media platforms thus allowing the grief-struck to reconnect with them. Martha begins by speaking to Ash via instant messaging, and then over the phone, soon agreeing to install Ash's personality onto a synthetic android body as part of the experimental phase of the service. The android flawlessly replicates Ash's appearance, and is even able to give Martha orgasms. But something about it seems amiss as it does not sleep at night and hardly reflects the original Ash's personality. Martha, frustrated, commands the android to jump off a cliff. It obeys, but Martha asserts that the real Ash never would have blindly followed her orders without arguing with her first. It just goes to show that reality, and our relationships with it, can become distorted, under the guise of a computer. As if recognizing it wasn't already hard enough. That's slavery. It's a little melodramatic, isn't it? No, she thought she was real. But she wasn't. It's barbaric. It wasn't really real, so it wasn't really barbaric. In prison systems, the particularly violent inmates are sentenced to solitary confinement, where they must go extended periods of time without a modicum of human contact, dwelling on their own thoughts until the point of insanity. Locked away in a confined space long enough, with no windows to look out of or magazines to read, and they will start to display abhorrent behaviors ranging from self-mutilation to catatonia, it is for that reason solitary confinement in correctional facilities is increasingly recognized as a cruel, inhumane practice worse than even the most barbaric forms of medieval torture. Solitary confinement notwithstanding, the goal of prison, or locking people behind cells to get them to think about their poor decisions, is to impose punishment upon the dissidents of society for not playing by the rules that you, I, and everyone else have agreed to. And what better way to impose punishment than to strip a person's autonomy? Or the ability to operate as an agent independent from government, law enforcement officials, and other authority figures. In the more abstract sense, to act autonomously is to think and behave freely without subordinating to forces beyond your control, like an oncoming hurricane or a traffic jam. Thus, if there is a hurricane about to destroy my house, as an autonomous agent I can relocate to somewhere safer. And if I am stuck in a traffic jam, I can leave my car and walk to work instead, as bad of an idea that might sound. Black Mirror, however, illustrates that the implementation of cookie technology can dial autonomy back 10, 20, or 100 million notches. For instance, in White Christmas, Matt Trent and Joe Potter reside in a remote log cabin in the middle of a frigid landscape. On Christmas morning, Matt expresses interest to Joe about getting to know him a little better, since the two have barely spoken to each other in five years. Matt discusses, in one of three flashbacks, his occupation that preceded his exile to the cabin. The flashback begins with an upper-class woman, 
named Greta, undergoing an operation to transfer her consciousness to a widget, one which, in turn, generates a sentient copy of herself via a cookie that is capable of completing mundane household tasks for the original Greta. Matt's job was to introduce the digitalized Greta to her new way of life. If needed, he could torment her into compliance by using time dilation, which involves setting a stopwatch to a few seconds or minutes in real time, and letting it count down while the digital consciousness spends months and years living in isolation, driven to boredom and near insanity. Matt uses time dilation against Greta and, after a period of three weeks, and then six months from her perspective, she has no other choice but to relent and do the job that she was created for. A twist reveals that Joe is also a digital consciousness, and is the subject of a comprehensive interrogation after his real-life counterpart killed his unfaithful ex-girlfriend's father and inadvertently killed her daughter. The officers behind the interrogation adjust the settings in the time dilation application so that one minute in real time feels like 1,000 years to Joe. Joe lives for an ostensible eternity listening to the song I Wish It Could Be Christmas Every Day that only gets louder every time he smashes the radio. The concept of cookie technology is further explored in USS Callister. This episode follows Robert Daly, the chief technical officer at a company that develops the popular massive multiplayer game, Infinity. At work, Daly is a talented computer programmer but is consistently mocked and disrespected by his colleagues, with the exception of the newcomer, Cole. At home, Daly plays a modded version of Infinity to live out his warped, Star Trek-esque power fantasy. The crew consists of the digital counterparts to Daly's colleagues, who have all wronged him in the workplace, and Daly often terrorizes them to defuse the frustration that he is otherwise unable to act upon. For example, he shouts at, suffocates, and strangles the crew when it does not comply with his orders. At one point, he made James Walton, the co-founder of Callister Incorporated, watch his young son get sucked into the vacuum of space. Thanks to the leadership of the Digital Coal, the crew hatches and successfully executes a plan to break free from Daly's wrath. Meanwhile, Daly is unable to exit the modded Infinity and presumably starves to death. Finally, in Black Museum, Rollo Haynes is the sole proprietor of a privately owned museum and tells a visitor, Nish, three stories behind rare criminal artifacts to pass the time while she waits for her car to charge. The third and most startling story is about a holographic projection of an African-American man named Clayton Lee, whose organic form was given the death sentence for first-degree murder. In a flashback, Haynes advises the original Lee to provide money to his family, even in death, by relinquishing the rights to his consciousness. Lee agrees to Haynes' proposal, and is subsequently executed by the electric chair, only to awake, in holographic form, inside Haynes' black museum. There, sociopathic visitors administer simulated electric shocks to Lee so many times that he is pushed to his mental limits and loses his self-awareness. And in a twist, it is revealed that Nish is Lee's daughter, and is exacting vengeance against Haynes for condemning Lee to an eternity of unimaginable pain. Despite knowing that he was innocent the whole time, and could still be exonerated before his execution, Nish extracts Haynes' consciousness from his physical body, and supplants it with Lee's hologram, burning down the museum in the process. To that end, the value of a free and autonomous existence cannot be understated because the most extreme alternative to it would be an eternity of listening to bad Christmas music, of subjugation to a socially inadequate computer nerd, or of re-experiencing the shock of an electric chair. And you thought solitary confinement was torturous enough.
Overall, by depicting the unintended consequences of technology that's been placed in the wrong hands, Charlie Brooker reveals one key, undeniable truth. We've developed new and improved ways to hurt each other. Consider that back when we were still hunter-gatherers, life was simpler but more dangerous. You couldn't send text messages to appease your romantic partner, play video games to distract yourself from real-world problems, or produce YouTube videos to gain internet notoriety. Instead, every waking hour of the day was spent on survival, on finding food and resources and shelter and, if deemed necessary, aggressing against our own kind, whether to establish dominance or to mark territories. The technological advancements that we are so boastful about clearly have enabled our capacity to live lethargically and with very little stress. But like a drug that we haven't yet learned to administer correctly, it's the modern tools, gadgets, and online services that don't mesh well with our psychobiological hardware and have thus perverted our aggressive impulses on unprecedented levels. The results are, disturbingly, the breakdown of memory, the distortion of reality, and the deprivation of autonomy. Cross a certain threshold, and you create the closest thing to a hell on earth possible, taking away what it means to remember the past and plan for the future interact with and recognize the physical world, and inhabit a body and mind, elements of human being, with a capital B, that are so basic, so fundamental to existence, that we don't even give them a second thought. Before long, death, or the permanent termination of existence, might as well be a highly coveted luxury, and not the fate that we all seem to dread at least by taking note of those exaggerated, satirized what-if scenarios, can we ever hope to avoid the same pitfalls our favorite Black Mirror characters stepped into the moment they thought that technology was the solution to all of their problems? If they tried love